Coming up on Animal Miracles. The weather was perfect. The sky was blue and the water was just bubbling with fish. A day of fishing turns into disaster in the quiet Colorado backcountry. And only a miracle stands in the way of certain death. Then, a power failure renders a woman's life support useless. When the power went out, he didn't feel that he could bark because he'd been repeatedly told, you don't bark in the middle of the night. Can her adopted pound dog save her? And later, a young couple starting their lives together with one special cat face a sudden and devastating fire. I feel that maybe he was sent to us to save our lives that evening. Next on Animal Miracles. Dogs have been our closest animal companions for thousands of years. Nearly every breed of dog we see today is genetically descended from the wolf. We may never know precisely why humans first brought dogs into their lives, perhaps protection, perhaps for hunting, maybe even companionship. But here's the story of a dog whose original purpose changed inexplicably one day from friend to savior. Since his retirement, Dale Windsor was able to spend a lot more time on the river. It's what he loved doing best. All his life, he's been an avid fly fisherman. I've been fly fishing for 40 years. It's calming. You've got to have real good coordination to flip that fly right where you want it. Here, downstream from the dam on Colorado's Cache Laputa River, offers the best fishing for miles around. So when Dale got a golden retriever, he called her Pooter too. It was only natural. He'd take his new friend to the river with him, doing what he loved the most. Pooter was a perfect dog to have fly fishing. Every time I went fishing, I took Pooter, which was daily. Pooter would play on the shore and watch Dale closely as he cast his fly into downstream pools time and time again. The fish were spawning, and Dale wanted Pooter to stay on shore so she wouldn't alarm the fish. Pooter would sit right on the bank, or on a rock where I was, and stay very quiet. Never move until I told her she could. It was about a year since Dale had had back surgery, and with each cast, he felt the pain slowly ebbing away as he and Pooter fell under the spell of murmuring water and misty air. The weather was perfect. The sky was blue, and the water was just bubbling with fish. And I caught two beautiful fish. Then I ran out of a lure that I used. Dale carefully made his way back to his truck to get a new fly. As Dale headed back to the river, he slipped on the slick bank and took a terrible fall. And I hit all those rocks, all the way to the bottom. Right into the water. And of course, that's the last I remember. Watching from the riverbank, Pooter saw her master unconscious and in deep trouble. Dale was carried downstream, oblivious to the danger he was in. As Dale is carried by the current farther downstream, he is caught in an eddy and slowly comes to rest where Pooter can grab a hold of him.
I remember when I came to, Uder was pulling on my vest. Trying to move me. I knew she was trying to help me. But what could I do? Uder manages to pull Dale up onto the shore, where he coughs the frigid water from his lungs. Finally, with my one arm and her help, I got over to the shore. I told her, Uder, I said, you have to help me. I can't make it. And she did, and she kept pulling. Dale was in bad shape. His back surgery incision had ripped open, and his right arm and wrist were shattered. He couldn't move without experiencing the worst pain of his life. With his good hand wrapped around Pooter's chain, the two moved slowly up the hill. Together, they traveled about 10 feet at a time. Pooter was straining badly. Dale had no choice but to hang on. It was probably a good 100 feet to get to the roadway. Of course, I was so full of blood that, and hurting so bad, I couldn't do any more. For over an hour, the determined dog slowly and painfully helped her master up the steep embankment. <sighs> Finally, Dale and Pooter made it back to the truck, but their ordeal was far from over. I didn't know. Could I get down that mountain? Dale mustered all his strength and crawled into the driver's seat. Hooter was gagging and, you know, just terrible. I knew that I couldn't leave her. Managing to start the truck, Dale began to drive himself home. Driving and shifting gears with the same hand, the pain was unbearable. But just realizing what Pooter had gone through kept him going. So it was 39 miles that I had to go. Very sharp corners and long ways down all the way through that area. But we went, I think, 15 miles. And then I stopped and rested there. There was no one anywhere. But with Pooter's help, I thought I gotta make it. Dale finally made it home to his wife, Virginia who drove him to the local clinic. My arm's broken. Oh, dear. And she took her, put her in the house, and then rushed me to really at the emergency center. Dr. Aaron Parkhurst was on duty when Dale came through emergency. Well, Dale Windsor sustained a fracture of his right wrist, a nasty fracture, and it had been a long time from the injury until he got to the hospital. So he had a lot of swelling and a lot of deformity. Dr. Parkhurst helped save Dale's hand, but he knows where the real credit lies. The dog knew things weren't right, and Pooter responded with uh, everything that she could possibly do. And fortunately for Dale, it was enough to get him out of a situation where it could have cost him his life. I'm convinced of that. With the help of his canine friend, Dale's injuries healed. But Pooter now had her own pain to contend with. All her back legs were torn. I left her in the hospital for maybe a month while they tried to help her. Couldn't do it. Despite the tireless efforts of the veterinarians, Pooter was never able to recover from the injuries she sustained in her heroic rescue of the person she loved.
I took her ashes and put them in the poodle. Right where we fell, she was there, always by my side. Had to be an angel there. I believe that. Gave her the strength to pull me. Coming up, helpless and breathless, a young woman struggles after a power failure stops her breathing machine, and only her companion dog Bronson can save her when Animal Miracles returns. Would you believe that nowadays there are more than 64 million dogs in North America alone? In some areas, dog ownership is as high as 50% of households. And for most of us, the family dog is a warm, friendly, important source of companionship and fun. But an increasing number of stories are emerging about the remarkable acts of dogs in service to their human charges. We all know about guide dogs, but lesser known are medical service dogs. Bronson is trained to medically assist his handler and best friend, Leanna Beasley. And not only that, Bronson also helps out with the chores around the house. Bronson, close. When I'm in my wheelchair, I have problems reaching the dryer. So I put the basket on the floor and Bronson will pull the laundry out of the dryer. He can uh, open and close the refrigerator door and retrieve for me if I ask him. Good boy, thank you. Bronson's trained to bring me the eggs one by one and I put them in a basket and then bring them back in the house. Bronson plays a crucial role in helping Leanna lead a normal and independent life. But he wasn't always a part of the Beasley family. In 1991, Leanna fell down the stairs in her home. The accident left her with brain injuries. Due to medical complications, Leanna was in a coma for two months. The doctors told my husband that it was time for him to make my final arrangements and to contact family because I, I wasn't expected to live. Miraculously, she survived. But now Leanna was diagnosed with epilepsy, frequent and unpredictable seizures that would leave her temporarily paralyzed. Leanna's husband, Harry, recalls the devastating effect Leanna's chronic health problems had on her life. Her spirit was crushed. Here's a person who was very much an outdoor person. And now all of a sudden, the self-esteem is gone and she was living in fear that if she goes out to do something, she could have a seizure. Harry and their son Michael became Leanna's primary caregivers. And I would always run home in order to get home as fast as I could to make sure my mom was okay, and I was always edgy. He got a lot of weight of the world put on his shoulders at a young age when it came to his mother. I didn't see how I could possibly be a parent or, or even be a wife. I saw no future for myself. After a seizure, Leanna could be confined to a wheelchair for days, but still she was determined to live an independent life. She had heard about medical service dogs that could sense epileptic seizures and wrote to the Epilepsy Foundation for information. Within two years, she was paired up with Bronson, a dog a trainer found languishing at the Humane Society. Bronson was originally somebody's outcast, somebody's throwaway, unwanted. Leanna and Bronson trained extensively, and Bronson became very intuitive about Leanna's seizures. When Bronson's alerting to a seizure, it's usually 15 to 20 minutes in advance, and one of the first things he does is he becomes concerned. He'll look me right in the eyes. If I'm sitting down in a chair, He's not happy with me being in the chair because he knows if I have a seizure, I could flip out of the chair. So he wants me on the floor. Then I'll tell Bronson to go get the phone. And then I page my husband at work, tell him that Bronson's alerting. When Bronson came into the picture, all of a sudden she had an independence that she had lost because now he was able to warn her ahead of time whether a seizure was coming. 
for me and Michael, it gave us a lot more independence too because now she'll do things on her own that she would never have thought about doing without Bronson. It's something else to see him when he, when he goes into his backpack. It's all business. It's straight work. He stands at attention and he heals and he sits. And I mean, if the dog could salute, he'd salute. Being able to prepare for her seizures gave Leanna a newfound independence during the day. But in the evening, things still weren't going well. Leanna had been diagnosed with sleep apnea and her doctors had given her a breathing machine so she could sleep safely during the night. Before receiving the machine, Leanna's breathing was intermittent and Bronson, sensing her distress, would bark and wake up the household. We were enjoying the first nights of peaceful sleep uh, in a long time and uh, Bronson seemed to be relieved himself that he could sleep through the night. In the middle of the night, as she fell into a deep sleep, there was a power failure. The breathing machine suddenly stopped. Bronson knew something was very, very wrong, but he was unsure of what to do. Bronson had been taught what the word quiet meant. So when the power went out, he didn't feel that he could bark because he'd been repeatedly told, you don't bark in the middle of the night. Because of an earlier operation on her trachea, Leanna was unable to breathe through her mouth. Now, in a cruel irony, the life-giving machine was suffocating her. Harry was such a sound sleeper, he was completely unaware of his wife's distress. Bronson knew the power had gone out in the house and the machine wasn't working and I was slowly going into respiratory arrest. So Bronson chewed the air hose in half. He shredded it. The next morning, Harry, unaware the power had gone off, woke up on his own and left for work quietly, not wanting to disturb Leanna. I woke up and I remember sitting up in bed and when I took the mask off, I realized it, this isn't attached and um, my eyes followed the length of the hose and here it is, just shredded in the middle. I looked over at Bronson, and I kind of shook the headgear at him, and I said, this is a brand new machine, what did you do? Bronson just kind of looked at me and hung his head, and I put the headgear down, and, and uh, I finished making the bed, and I glanced over at the clock, and it's flashing at me, and then it dawned on me that we had had a power failure. And I turned around and I looked at Bronson and I said, you knew, didn't you? And he just sat there and looked at me and I go, oh, Bronson, I'm sorry. Good boy, good boy. By chewing through the hose, Bronson had saved Leanna's life. He has never shredded a toy. He's got toys that are six years old that I bought him back when I first got him. He knew he had to chew that hose in half and he did it. And he saved my life. The Beasley family is forever grateful to Bronson, not only for saving Leanna's life, but for what he has done and continues to do for all of them. Good work. Bronson is a blessing. He's an answer to a prayer. Because Lord knows at that time we were given a lot of them. I guess I think he's an angel with four paws. My husband is my companion in life and my soulmate. But in my heart of hearts, and in my soul, I can't help but say Bronson is my best friend. Next, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, and hundreds of reptiles rely on the kindness of a stranger. When Animal Miracles returns. When most of us think of a pet, we think of cats, dogs, birds. We feel camaraderie with other warm-blooded creatures. But for many people, reptiles, snakes, and amphibians are just as popular and desirable as pets. Our love for animals would appear to transcend stereotypes and convention. And when these cold-blooded pets need a miracle, there are, thankfully, people out there for whom compassion and respect know no bounds. 
The Rainforest Reptile Refuge Society in Surrey, British Columbia, is sanctuary to dozens of iguanas, 22 caimans, as well as many snakes and exotic birds. They are all orphans, pets abandoned by their owners. They were unwanted and unloved, except by the refuge's founder, Christine Schramm. A typical day at the refuge starts about 5 a.m and ends about 11 p.m. or even later, with a few short breaks in between. There's about between three and 400 exotic animals to look after, and exotic animals are a little harder to look after than cats and dogs. Christine has a real affinity for reptiles. She believes that they sense this and reciprocate. <laughs> People will say, oh, well, it's a snake. You know, it just reacts to stimuli. That's ridiculous. Hi guys. Hello. And they all react a different way. And sometimes they, just like us, they wake up on the wrong side of the bed. And that's the day when you have to watch that you don't get bitten. Christine's passion for these animals was born with her first rescue of a little caiman named Carmen. And I saw a baby caiman in a pet store and she wasn't in water or anything, and I didn't know anything about alligators or crocodiles, except I knew that they live in water. So I protested, and I landed up taking Carmen home. She's now about five feet long, and uh, people just started dropping off animals after that. Hey, guys. Christine approaches the animals with great respect, but very little fear, because they have come to regard her as a benefactor. Move, pep Peppy. I gotta move this one. We realized that there were many more Chainsaw. exotic animals out there that get mistreated and people get tired of them very quickly because they're really, really hard to look after. They're not like your average dog or cat. I mean, even dogs and cats get dumped, but usually you can find a home for a dog or a cat, but how do you find a home for a caiman? Good boy. Oh, lazy, lazy, lazy. Christine recognizes that most people have good intentions, but soon reality overwhelms them. People have the idea that they'll buy a baby caiman or a monitor lizard, and when it's grown up, they'll be able to walk with it on a leash down the street. That's totally ridiculous. You can't walk a caiman, you'd lose your ankles. And uh, they are very intelligent, but they're not trainable. And a lot of people get disillusioned. They don't realize when they buy an animal that it's not cuddly. Hi, guys. Hi. It's not just a job to Christine. Oh, yeah? It's a calling. Some days you wake up and you wonder why you're doing this, but um, it is very rewarding. And as long as they are sold in pet stores and as long as people actually want them, there's always going to be a need for animal shelters for exotic animals. Christine doesn't claim to be an animal expert, just someone who is very much in tune with the animals now entrusted to her. I live with them day in and day out, and I can tell when there's something wrong with them, but I can't tell you how to treat that animal for the illness it has. You have to take the animal to a vet. One of the refuge's most distinguished residents is Murgatroyd, the yellow-footed tortoise. Two of her feet are worn away from the stress of an earlier captivity. She was rescued by a missionary uh, in Ecuador. Apparently she uh, was destined for the stew pot and she only saved herself by rubbing her feet down to stumps. After Murgatroyd's initial captivity, she ended up in the care of Erica Kelly, who treated her wounds as best she could. I bandaged her several times a day because she would not keep them on, of course. She would like to motor around and move around. And it took about six to eight weeks until it was healed. She needed warmth. She needed companionship of her own kind. And she needed somebody that I thought would be really interested. But when I gave her to Christine, she just, you know, here, I'm home. Hi, Mom, I said. <laughs> it was beautiful to see. Murgatroyd is really protective of her iguana friends. And I sometimes see small iguanas especially going for a ride on Murgatroyd. I think they, they think it's fun or maybe they're too lazy to go from one end of the cage to the other. 
Murgatroyd and the other residents of the Rainforest Reptile Refuge actually got off to a rather shaky start. We put Murgatroyd with the iguanas, never thinking that the iguanas would be petrified of her. For the first four or five days, I could not get the iguanas to come down and eat. So all of their food on the top level was all eaten, but the dishes on the bottom were not touched at all, except that Murgatroyd thought it was wonderful because she would go around from dish to dish and she didn't have any competition. She could eat whatever she wanted. But it always takes one brave soul. And one day, a young male iguana decided that, hey, we've had enough of this. So he comes strolling down the branch and looks both ways. He's really nervous. He looks around, nothing's going to hurt me. Maybe I'll take a bite. He started eating. Nothing happened to him. Murgatroyd ate with him. A few minutes later, you wouldn't believe it. All these iguanas looked down and nothing happened to him. I guess we can all crawl down now too. And about 20 of them came down and ate with Murgatroyd. I tell people we don't buy animals and we certainly don't sell them or trade them. We don't regard our animals as pets. We're, we're their guardians. We're just looking after them until something better comes along for them. For those animals who, through no fault of their own, can't be free, the Rainforest Reptile Refuge, a little piece of heaven on earth, allows them to live long, healthy, and happy lives. Well, when I think of how I got Murgatroyd, and now she is about 35, 40 years old, uh, she is very healthy, she is very good looking, and she is obviously very happy. Normally, I think those poor little tortoises that are adopted die after a few years. So just her being here with us after this time, I think it's a miracle. Next on Animal Miracles, drugs and poverty threaten to destroy one woman's very existence. I think I was just so lonely and desperate. Until she's ready for a miracle of her own. In shelters across North America, tens of thousands of abandoned or unwanted dogs are waiting to be adopted. They come in all shapes and sizes, and all they would seem to have in common is their capacity to love and their need to find a home. These orphaned animals also have the ability to transform the lives of their next benefactors. Here's the story of a remarkable program which brings together people and animals in need with miraculous results. It would be nice to believe that everyone has the same opportunities in life, but not every story has a happy beginning. In Vancouver, Canada, the farthest one can fall often means this neighborhood, the downtown east side, Hastings and Maine. This is one of the most notorious mean streets in all of North America. You can get whatever you want, whenever you want, how much you want, anytime. There's death and destruction all over down there. This is where Brenda Hawks found herself living. This is where she knew she would die if something didn't change. I used to wake up and wonder what crime I was going to do, how I was going to get the drugs I needed. Um, I didn't want to wake up a lot of times, but I did. I lived in a very dysfunctional family. I was adopted, and I was told that I was lucky to be there. And I didn't know where I came from. And I thought, ooh, I'm lucky to be here. It must have been really bad. I had a dog when I was young, and I remember sitting in my closet a lot with my dog, talking to my dog. I believe that that's the only person that loved me, because it was unconditional. And I didn't know back then what it was all about, but I'm learning that that's what it was. Brenda's life was about to follow a very long and difficult road where love was only a distant and fading memory. I 
I started using drugs and alcohol many, many years ago. I was 12, and it's progressed for 35 years. But there came a point when Brenda knew it would cost her her life if she continued. Salvation came from a most unlikely source. I was in prison 18 times, and last time I was in prison, I just knew inside myself, I don't know what it was that changed, but I just knew inside that I just couldn't do it anymore because I was going to die. And I started working at the Cannibals, and that's where things really started changing. Burnaby Correctional Center has a facility where inmates can apply to work. Freedom Kennels trains the women to care for the dogs, but offers so much more. Jane Nelson is the program's director. What Freedom Kennels is, is um, a therapeutic uh, work program designed for the women who are incarcerated here. Any woman who has an interest um, can apply for the program. They have an interview, like a job interview, and um, you know if that goes well, then the, uh, the woman is hired into the program, and, and um, then they can start um, their training. Yeah, those are tear stains. I mean, you can get tear stain remover, but it, okay. it's not that hard. Right. Keep that Alicia Holmes is one of the instructors. Working with dogs is a really unique way um, to work with the women because uh, you're able to teach through the dogs that, you know, it's really important for things like coming to work on time because um, they need to be fed or they need their medications at a certain time. So it, it's kind of a, a neat way to be able to teach uh, job skills, not, not necessarily specifically to working with dogs, but any job. I think I was just so lonely and desperate that I had to do something different. But working with the dogs, I started to um, feel some self-worth, self-esteem. I think a large percentage of the women who come in to an institution, the lives that they had as children uh, growing up is, for, for the most part, is horrible. Most of them have suffered uh, terrible abuse, um, living in poverty, um, you know, living in dysfunctional families, being shuffled from one foster home to the next. And, you know, the dogs don't judge them, they don't care. They don't care what the women have done. If the women are nice to them and take them for walks, they adore them. The program of Freedom Kennels, I believe in my heart that it changed my life. I could give love to the dogs and I could receive it. And that's, I think, what I was missing for so long. And it was really hard for me to leave prison when it was time. Um, I had parole offered to me and I refused that. I decided to do all my time because what I was getting from working with the dogs is something I've never had in my life. And it's something that I just, I couldn't go back to the street because I wasn't going to live. And I wanted to learn how to fix my heroin problem. After six months in a recovery program, Brenda was again on the streets. But this time would be different. What kept her from returning to heroin? I work at a dog grooming salon. When I wake up in the morning now, I wake up in a bed. I have my own apartment that I pay for. I have a job that I enjoy going to every day. It gives my life meaning, and I feel worthwhile. I'm accomplishing something. I've accomplished a lot with in a year. Barbara Stoner became not only Brenda's employer, but her friend. She's a, she's a wonderful, wonderful lady. And when she gave me the keys to the shop, I couldn't tell her what it meant to me. Like, I don't know if most people can understand that, but it was like huge for me. She does a good job. She does an excellent job. The animals also like her. And, and we have found that uh, even difficult dogs like Brenda are because she's calm and talks to them and that they know that she likes them. That dogs need to know that. My ultimate dream is to have some acreage and I would like to find people who are hurt, rejected, abandoned 
and also animals who have been hurt, rejected, and abandoned, and bring them together for a healing process for both. That's what I found, and I would love to be able to do it for others. It's hard to believe that anyone can go through childhood without experiencing trust and love. It's the unconditional love Brenda received from the dogs that taught her to love herself and others. I believe that the miracle in this was the dogs that I worked with it in prison. I would not be sitting here talking to you if it wasn't for the dogs. Like it was the beginning of my healing process. And I believe that's a miracle. Next on Animal Miracles, a young couple faces certain death. This miraculous story, when we return. Archaeological evidence shows that people began domesticating cats nearly 8,000 years ago. Perhaps that's why we see such remarkable bonds between people and their cats. Any cat owner will tell you that the relationship is enriching. But here's the story of a family pet who played a role far beyond mere companionship and perhaps confirms our ancient ties to these feline friends. Life is good for Vern and Rita Shore, who live on Texada Island, just off the west coast of Canada. Priorities are simple, clean air, children, and lots of love. That's because of something that happened 27 years ago that caused them to assess the important things in life. Well, I, we, were, we had just married, and we managed to get two cats, Jethro and, and Hector. They were kittens when we got them, and, and those were our, our babies. Probably the biggest thing about Jethro was, was the way that he, he loved people. He wanted to be around people. He was, a, he was a people person. We did a lot of traveling in those days, up, up into the Yukon and uh, up to Alaska. <laughs> Vern was trucking, and we took the cats with us. <laughs> Jethro was uh, one of the few cats that was a really good traveler. Whether he was on the dash of the motorhome or, <laughs> you know, in the luggage compartment of the bus in a, in a cat cage, he loved traveling. We got a job in Gresham, Oregon, out east of Portland, in uh, the winter of 74, and we moved into a brand new apartment quite happy with that. We'd found a real cheap one. It was a bachelor suite. You know, we were just married and, you know, low budget and all this stuff. This was a brand new apartment complex and there had been numerous electrical problems. The uh, sauna was out of order because of electrical problems. But with an eye on their future, the newlyweds were prepared to put up with a few electrical inconveniences to stay within their budget. And they happily settled in with the cats. Jethro, in particular, adapted quickly to apartment life. He, he wasn't loud, he wasn't uh, boisterous. He was just a laid back cat. He would have our dinner and feed the cats and then we probably curled up on the couch and watch some TV or we were newlyweds, so. <laughs> when it was time to turn in, neither Vern nor Rita realized that the tapestry covering the back of the couch had slipped onto the baseboard heater. As Vern and Rita drifted off to sleep, they were unaware that the electrical problems had caused the baseboard heaters to begin to overheat. Jethro began to stir in his sleep. In a matter of minutes, the thin fabric of the tapestry began to smolder and then burst into flames. As the small apartment began to fill with smoke, Jethro became more and more agitated. Sensing that something was wrong, he leapt up upon the bed and tried to wake Vern and Rita. After trying to wake Vern up, Jethro then moved over to Rita, meowing frantically. 
My first sense was there was something on my chest and it was like clawing and jumping around and what is going on, you know, get off me. <laughs> but Jethro wouldn't get off. He had to let them both know how perilous the situation was. Oh, he was just screaming. It, it sounded more like a cat fight, you know, like two tomcats fighting. He was just screaming and clawing the blankets. Both Vern and Rita were very groggy and slow to realize what was going on. Because we were sleeping side by side, he was probably going back and forth trying to wake us up, you know, because the cat knew what was going on. Finally, Jethro's message was getting through all too clearly. As a child, Rita had survived a house fire, and now as she slowly awoke, her childhood nightmares came flooding back. When I smelt that smell, I, I remembered my the fire when I was a, a child, you know, and and I, I knew there was something really major going on here. Rita turned to Vern and desperately shook him away. It only took a second until I could smell the smoke. And then I tried to leap out of bed and I was so dizzy, I, I, I couldn't stand up. I tried to stand up, I couldn't stand up, so I crawled on my hands and knees and got the door open. Through the dense air of the smoke-filled room, Vern looked and saw the source. We had a oriental tapestry hanging over the back of the couch. It was flaming. Vern grabbed the burning tapestry and ran to throw it over the balcony. In a second surge of strength, he went back for the couch. I think it was mostly adrenaline. That was even the scariest part because it was flaming. I think that's why the couch went off the balcony because it was a such an, a, I mean, the adrenaline was just pumping. It was, when, when, the, when, when the reality sets in of what, what's happening here, it, it's, it was sort of a fight or flight reaction. Still in shock, Rita began to realize just how close their small apartment was to being entirely engulfed by flames. I was quite confused and frightened, and I knew we, we had to get out of there. With the fire behind them, Vern and Rita marveled at what had just taken place. I honestly believe that if the cat hadn't woke us up, I would have been dead in another five minutes. I think the miracle in all of this is the fact that our big, happy, fat, laid-back cat performed such a heroic feat. He did something that was so totally out of character. That I, I never would have expected it or guessed it. That, that that it would have been him that would do something like that. For Rita, surviving one fire was extremely lucky. To survive a second was a miracle. I feel that maybe he was sent to us to save our lives that evening. Because of Jethro, we, we had the rest of our lives to live now. We raised children, we moved to other places, we worked different jobs, and we were able to fulfill our, our destiny on, on this planet. This is my new friend, Ben. He's a cat looking for a new family through adoption at a nearby shelter. And you can visit your local Humane Society or Animal Shelter if you're able to bring a dog or cat into your family, and you'll be glad you did. I'm Alan Thick, and we'll see you next time with more miraculous stories. What do you think, Ben? Huh? I thought you were good.